We think of the quarterback position as the most steady during every single fantasy football season. But shockingly, five of the top 12 scores last season at the position were drafted outside of the start of round 10. Those names, Jordan Love, Brock Purdy, Kyler Murray, CJ Stroud, and obviously Joe Flacco. Had we not seen that one coming? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Hayden. I mean, it counts. It counts. The dude had 21, 19, 27, 24 points in the season. Okay. So today we're going to bring you our quarterback sleepers. Again, it's pretty relevant, Hayden, because you and I last year were drafting a lot of elite quarterbacks, guys that we hoped we scored anywhere from 24 to 23 points on a weekly basis. But it feels like the position is more loaded than ever at the NFL level. And so that means guys are just going to fall down drafts. Last year was pretty fluky when it came to quarterback injuries, though. Like a lot of like the elite guys oh, got injured. Mahomes didn't have a wide receiver that he can trust. So there was kind of some circumstance, even like Jalen Hurts. He wasn't himself really bad offensive coordinator there as well. So I think it was kind of a fluky year, um, but I feel pretty good about like the top 12 guys. The problem, though, is I want to draft a bunch of these running backs. I, I've yeah. been mixing in a couple more uh, elite tight ends this year than I have previously. So there are some times where I won't have a quarterback until we kind of get into this 120 range, and then I'll have to draft three of them. So uh, excited for the show. Yep. As Hayden said, the parameters for the show start of round 10 and later 120 plus ADP that cutoff here is Trevor Lawrence, who's quarterback 14 and everyone that goes before him. So that includes rookies like Jaden Daniels and Caleb Williams. Okay. We're going to do the show in order of confidence. So who do you want to nominate for first that you most likely believe is going to destroy their ADP in a positive way. Geno Smith is the guy I've been drafting yes, the sir. most. And I mean, we talked about it, this with Noah Fant and I just really like the offensive coordinator, um, eighth in pass rate, fourth and deep pass rate of all power five teams. That's Ryan Grubb with the Huskies last year, similar skill set when it comes to the three wide receiver sets and the style of quarterback that Ryan Grubb's dealing with, with the Seahawks as well. In the last two years, Geno Smith, 111th and 144th in fantasy points over replacement per game. He's being drafted well after that. And this is probably the best environment that he's had in terms of projected points this upcoming season. Last year, things didn't go as cleanly. They were 25th in red zone touchdown rate. That's a stat that typically regresses, especially when you have some freak shows like DK Metcalf in your starting lineup. They were dead last, like you said, in plays per game. That's yeah. not going to be the same thing this season. They were also 25th in pass block win rate because the offensive line, particularly their tackles, uh, they got beat up. The interior has not been good. There's a chance that with a new uh, offensive staff in place and kind of overturning some of these interior guys that that gets cleaned up. And there's also a chance that JSN just turns into the guy that we were kind of promised as a prospect. So there's a lot of ways where Geno Smith can go back and, and in my opinion, I think that Geno Smith is like the most underrated player in the entire NFL. He's been wow. number one in completion percentage over expected since he took over about three seasons ago. His pocket navigation skills are awesome. He's all he's had had to really put those on display because of that offensive line. And he throws one of the best balls that you'll see. Like, that's not an exaggeration. Like his deep ball accuracy and touch is unbelievable. And I think that this yeah. is the type of staff and skill skill talent around him to really take advantage of that. Now, I will say from a zoomed out view, and we've had some comments about this, Geno Smith's only had one good season. And, you know, that's kind of a fact. But when you zoom in and when you watch the games, you can see that a lot of the same skills that he had back in 2022 and the positive performances showed up last season. It was just the dynamic around him definitely was not good. I mean, the largest issue that he faced last year in Seattle in general was the amount of pressure that they allowed and their inability to handle it. I mean, he was under pressure on nearly 41% of his dropbacks. That was 28th in the league after a 34% rate back in 2022, which still wasn't even top half. That was 21st in the NFL. Okay. And then under pressure, Hayden, Geno Smith averaged a league low 6.4 air yards per attempt, which is not Geno Smith football, because as you just said, he can handle pressure. Like he keeps his eyes up, he works through it, he navigates it, and then wants to throw more and more down the field. And 
one of my big mottos every off season is to try to get ahead of coaching changes because it can be difficult for our heads to like wrap around how much of a positive or negative impact that can have. I am so excited for Ryan Grubb in the NFL from a passing standpoint. So often it was quick throw, quick throw shot play. And among all quarterbacks in the NFL, if you made a list, who do you think fits that quick throw, quick throw shot play mentality? Uh, I would put Geno Smith near the top of that oh, yeah. list. So super excited along with hopefully a healthier offensive line and along with these three wide receivers, plus Noah Fant, who we just talked about our Titan sleeper show. It's a really great dynamic and that we're able to draft Geno Smith all the way down as quarterback 23, 171 overall. I'm doing it often. Geno Smith also lost four touchdowns to defensive pass interferences, literally in the end zone. Like he threw the pass defensive pass interference. He doesn't get credit for the touchdown, but that was the most in the NFL. So there's some like weird, like deep stats uh, that Geno Smith, there's a bunch of regression uh, coming his way. And I'm not concerned about Sam Howell. Like we watched the, the Jahan no. Dotson and Terry McLaurin for, for podcasts. He was just not very good. He couldn't handle the pressure. If he was in the, in the environment that, that Geno Smith was oh. playing behind last year, I and mean, we would have been talking about the sack record. He, uh, he was perhaps. the worst quarterback under pressure in the NFL last season. Yeah, I, I, I have, I would put his bench risk at 2%, 5%. Okay. My next name is uh, Justin Herbert, and I know all of you out there are just saying to nice. yourselves, well, how? He can't even throw the football. He's not even going to throw the football in this offense, so how can he be a sleeper quarterback? There are massive changes to this Los Angeles Chargers team. Obvious coaching ones. We'll get into that. But first, I mean, no Keenan Allen, no Big Mike, no Austin Eckler. That was a trio that we have always attached to Justin Herbert in the NFL. But in some ways, we've exchanged that for a possible unreal offensive line. Okay. And I believe an unreal offensive line can give us a fantastic, efficient Justin Herbert season, not talking volume standpoint, but from an efficiency standpoint, last year, he was when kept clean the pocket 15 to one touchdown to interception ratio. They threw the ball 36.6 attempts per game. That would have been seventh most when Justin Herbert was in there across the league. So then you look at someone like the San Francisco 49ers, okay, who is efficient, but not much volume. They throw the ball 30 times per game. That was 30th across the league. Obviously, that relies on efficiency, and Greg Roman is definitely not Kyle Shanahan. But I'm looking at this, Hayden, from like a simple lens. Jim Harbaugh is a winning football coach. Greg Roman has created great fantasy seasons in the past, from the Colin Kaepernick days to the Lamar Jackson days. Justin Herbert is a really, really good quarterback in the league. Mm -hmm. And I think has some untapped potential from a rushing and athleticism standpoint to his game too. And this is again, possibly an awesome offensive line he's playing behind. So we've already seen this like mm -hmm. two seasons to open his career. He was the quarterback eight and quarterback two in points per game. So we just have to get back to that on a better coach team. And I think we're going to get there this season. He'll have to run hot with touchdowns, but yes. that's exactly what Justin Herbert has done. Even going back to his, his rookie year. Also, if you look at Herbert's like offensive coordinators throughout his career, not the prettiest list. I mean, so it's a lot of guys that are not going to be offensive coordinators uh, again. And there's a chance that Lad McConkey like just is a really good player right out of the gate. And Josh Palmer, I think, is one of these underrated wide receivers. I wouldn't be surprised if he gets a, a big contract extension that people aren't ready for as well. They seem to really like him. So yeah, it's, the volume is not going to be the same, but the price tag is really down. And if Justin Herbert does get there, let's say he throws 32 touchdowns this season, I really like that in best ball because if I get Justin Herbert right, that means I got Ladd McConkey right. That means I got Josh Palmer right. Um, and maybe even like Kamani Vidal or somebody like that later in the draft. So it, it is a player I'm targeting. I'm not expecting the, the peak Justin Herbert, but at some point he can't be going well, behind like Jared Goff and these guys. Yeah, I mean, you're not having to play anywhere close to peak Justin Herbert. I of mean, course. Oh, yeah. the, the common sentiment out there is that this team is just going to run the football and that's their offense. So Justin Herbert isn't going to be asked to do anything. And so we're able to get him as quarterback 17, 133 right now. Uh, I'll take that all day because again, mm -hmm. I believe that Justin Herbert is one of the best young passers in the league. This is going to be a winning team, which means they score more points than their opponents. And sure, some of that is going to be through rushing. A lot of it is going to be through rushing. We also don't know which running back that's going to be. And as we talked about the running back sleeper show and all these others, uh, it's not being drafted as if anyone has tons of belief in the rushing of game course, right. at this moment. 
So let's just attack that passing game. I mean, I'm, I'm, I get why people are so unsure about the volume aspect, but man, I just think that this team is going to surprise people from a wins loss and efficiency standpoint. And I want to bank on that. And we can't copy paste all of Greg Roman's neutral pass rates when his quarterbacks have been like Alex Smith, Colin Kaepernick and Lamar, Young Jackson. Lamar Jackson. I mean, yes. like it's a little bit different of the, the player totally. archives. And also we do a bunch of prospect videos on our channel. Go watch the lad McConkie one. Like Josh and I were pretty, pretty optimistic on what lad McConkie is going to be in the league. And I also don't want to overlook the Ray Sean Slater, Zion Johnson, Joe Alt yeah. and Jamari Salier aspect of this, like yeah. four and especially three awesome offensive yeah. linemen that when he's not pressured, he has a hose to hit every single blade of grass on the yeah. field. Okay, that's enough. Hayden mentioned uh, best ball. If you've heard of the name, all you do is draft and that's it. There's no waivers. There's no setting your lineups. We do all of that stuff for you. All you do is draft. It's the best part of fantasy football. If you're in one of these beautiful yellow states, look at the map right now. Play an underdog. Start this weekend. If you click the link in the description down below, we'll throw some money back at you. And if you're in a state that surely has Pick'em or Champions, we'll have to throw a new special for you as well. So again, start playing best ball right now this weekend and click the link in the description. Okay, third name, Hayden, who is it? This is the highest upside option out there and very stackable. Deshaun Watson, and this is really just looking at what Kevin Stefanski has been able to do recently. And this is fully acknowledging that Deshaun Watson has been awful, like truly, yes. truly awful. But... You look at it last year, he was awful, right? He still finishes the quarterback five, quarterback eight, quarterback 10, quarterback 14 in four of his five actually healthy games. Like He was awful and still was in the lineup a lot of those times. And the reason is because Kevin Stefanski is a good play caller. They have legit weapons and they're continuing to add weapons. And if you really start to look at what the Browns have done in the last couple off seasons, here every single acquisition has been about we want to pass the ball more they were one of the most run heavy teams for a long time but since nick chubb's injury in particular last season they were number one in neutral pass rate they add jerry judy this offseason they give david and joku a bunch of money they trade for amari cooper they trade for deshaun watson they trade for elijah moore everything that they're trying to do is through one lens let's be able to pass the ball on top of that they were fourth in pass block win rate. The offensive line is still pretty good. They were number one in plays per game. And like I said, they were number one uh, after that Nick Chubb injury in neutral pass rate. So Deshaun Watson could be really bad and just the environment is enough to keep him going. And there is a, ch a chance that he becomes just a little bit closer to where he was with the Texans as a right. player and if that's the case now we're talking about somebody that can completely be the guy that you need but this is really just looking at what the browns have done and putting a lot of faith into kevin stefanski uh not necessarily putting a lot of faith in deshaun watson quite frankly like he doesn't even need to be that good to be in the mix we obviously used to get rushing points from deshaun watson and i bring that up because the easiest path to being a sleeper quarterback to fantasy performer on a weekly basis is the rushing floor that these players give you and the passing points on top of that. But now the entire fantasy football world has caught on to that. So you again, go from the quarterback 15 and later, there really isn't a player on this list that necessarily has a chance of rushing production. We'll maybe get to one or two later on. Mm -hmm. And Deshaun Watson has that in his history and maybe he brings it back. But again, the injuries that he had, broke tater cuff injury in week three set out to week seven then he aggravated again then in week nine he discovered a fracture in his arm like yeah the momentum just never got going in 2023 and really hasn't from the start and as you said deshaun watson's an awful in multiple ways let's say yeah. uh but he's been really bad at playing quarterback in his time in cleveland i don't know how that's totally going to improve i will say he did improve in 2023 versus 2022, I, I we talked about this on the uh, the Crossroad show. I'm a bit apprehensive that it felt like just from watching every single series that Kevin Stefanski felt a bit more comfortable, like calling plays for Joe Flacco and opening up the playbook. But guess what? In order for like this team to succeed and to win, Deshaun Watson has to play well. Right. He has to play at least to the level that mm -hmm. Joe Flacco did. And it's either going to work or it's not going to. Yep. 
And it's a big, again, crossroads turning point moment for Deshaun Watson, I think, in his career in the Browns. Because if it doesn't work this year, I don't care what the money is. You basically, it it is over. Yeah, it would be like the Russell Wilson thing. But when Joe Flacco was really heating up, a lot of that was just throwing the ball deep downfield repeatedly. And I think at the best, that was kind of what Deshaun Watson was like really good at. Like he would just plan on the back foot and launch passes to the sideline. So maybe they can kind of get into what they were doing with Joe Flacco. And like you mentioned, what quarterback five top five quarterback whatever joe flacco was last year i mean let's be honest that was joe flacco so the environment is basically as good as it gets okay i'm gonna go with tua tunga vailoa uh you went with sean watson's quarterback 21 two is going as quarterback 15 so the first quarterback that's eligible for this list it's weird to frame it this way but i don't know if most people out there realize that tua is a spike week quarterback Oh, yeah. You know, I think when you view this Miami Dolphins team and think of them big picture, it's, oh, everyone is super consistent on a weekly basis because you're getting Tyree Kill, you're getting Jalen Waddle, you're getting this rushing attack. But for Tua, that's not the case. He's had seven weeks inside of the top 12 scores at the position and then 10 outside of it this past season. Okay. And it goes even deeper. I uh, believe Rich Rebar pointed this out that. He's had seven weeks as a top four scorer over the past two seasons, but just five other weeks as a top 12 scoring quarterback. So the thing with Tua is he basically has to throw three plus touchdowns to be inside the top 10 scores in any given week. And if he doesn't do that, then he's either going to hover around that 12 to 14 mark, or if he throws for one touchdown, he's in that 20 plus mark. And it's because of a total lack of rushing ability, Mm -hmm. a total lack of of creativity. Now, when you go back and look at Tua in his early careers, or even at Alabama, he was a bit more mobile. You know, early in his career, he had games of 20 or 30 plus rushing yards. Last season, he had 35 carries for 74 total yards. We we knew the narrative heading into the year. It was, I'm going to beef up. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take some martial arts classes. I don't want (laughs) to get these concussions and miss time on an NFL field. But what has been the narrative this offseason? Skinny Tua. It's skinny (laughs) Tua. It's almost like, Hey, this is not who we're looking at. It's doppelganger who's now playing. Yeah. To me, that is, it's all a choice. It's a decision. And it's not just, I think from the quarterback, it's probably a directive from Mike McDaniel who knows that playmaking is imperative to win when the defense has an answer Mm -hmm. that it can make the difference in two or three plays per game. So look, I'm not going to say that Tua now is going to go rush for 40 or 50 or 60 yards per game, but I believe that we're going to get more creativity from Tua Tungavailoa this year than we did this past season when he already led the league in passing yards throughout the throughout the league. Yeah, shout out to Mike McDaniel for for getting Tua to lead the league and also obviously Tyree Kill. I'm drafting a lot of Jalen Waddle this year. There's not really a second round wide receiver that I absolutely love, so I do click the Jalen Waddle button and then i do get some more to it this year um yeah he's a spike week guy that's why i like him in best ball more than in redraft leagues especially you can pair him up with but even in the redraft league i think it's okay hayden because you can pair him up with another guy and as we have seen in the past the dolphins dominate average or especially bad teams and so when you have that matchup tua can be a top five top seven score for you yeah i i remember all last year in stats versus film i would bring up has the Dolphins played this team this season or in the, the previous season? And if they hadn't, those defenses just didn't. It was way too much going on. And I don't blame them. Like, there's players running at a million miles an hour in every single direction. Um, and then also the December comes around. Maybe we can slide Tua onto the bench there um, as well. So there's there's ways to kind of to build around this thing. But I, I am intrigued to see skinny Tua because there was a lot of times at Alabama where not necessarily that he was, like, running for a bunch of yards, but him just, like, breaking the pocket – he kind of had yeah. this one move, like throw off one foot with his left hand, kind of a signature move. And it's been a little bit since since we've seen Tua do that. Okay, I have one more point on Tua. By the way, this Dolphins team is projected for the fourth most points to be scored this season. Okay? This is a great note from Jacob Gibbs, who's been doing awesome statistical work that on guy's Twitter. put okay? out content. Uh, yeah, every day. Uh, the Dolphins played with a lead on 50% of their drives last season. Okay? Only the 49ers, Ravens, and Lions had a higher rate. They were also one of four teams with a double digit lead on 50 plus drives and one of two to play with a 20 point lead on 20 plus drives. Okay. So bring that in, absorb it. Mm -hmm. Here's more this year. This team is only projected for nine and a half wins. Okay. 
That likely means fewer big leads and more passing because when they were in neutral situations this past season, they had the third highest pass rate, but finished with the 17th in pass rate because again of those double digit or 20 plus point leads they had yep. on their opponents. So closer games to me mm -hmm. just is going to lead for more volume, more opportunity for Tua and also less of that dynamic rushing that we saw last year, the 18 rushing touchdowns that Raheem Mostert yep. scored as well. And again, they're projected for the fourth most points. So in a way we could get the guy who led the league in passing yards last year and maybe even more of them this year. Yeah, game script is something we talk about on the show all the time, and it really obviously was going the wrong way. The The Dolphins, we'll see how their defensive line looks. A lot of guys coming back from injury. There were some times where the Dolphins' defense looked really good. We'll see if they are that good this season. Okay, two more names. Bo Nix, this is really down the list here. Um, but it's one of your favorite picks so far yeah, this summer. He, I, I have been drafting him a decent bit. Um, obviously, everyone's going to say he's a screen merchant. He's an RPO merchant. I'm not going to argue with that. Like He did a lot of that at Oregon. That's why his stats were so good. But I also have these filters on these fancy websites, and I can remove his screen attempts and his RPO attempts. And when I do that, we're talking about the big boy throws only. Number one in PFF passing greed. Number one in turnover worthy play rate. Number two in EPA. Number two in success rate of all of the power five college quarterbacks. So when he was asked to make a play, he was able to do that. And I think that's why he went round one. Uh, sh I, I believe that Sean Payton was basically sealing my notes after uh, his press he conference. Uh, he said the same things, but here, here's the reason why I like him in fantasy a little bit super flex deep in best ball, those type of leagues. He averaged 28 rushing yards in 0.75 rushing touchdowns per game at Oregon. That's a sample size of 27 games. That's like sneaky athleticism, if you will. Um, I think that Bo Nix has that. In fact, if you go talk to the people that are watching him at Auburn, people were saying that he was trying to make a play too much. Like he had too much playmaking, and it would kind of lead him into these like mind-numbing interceptions. At Oregon, he found the, the correct balance of being a distributor and then occasionally making the play. There is some quarterback design stuff at Oregon with Bo Nix. So I'm curious to see what Sean Payton's going to do, but we have seen Sean Payton run a fast offense, get the ball out quick and get a lot of cheap production from his quarterbacks. Um, so maybe we'll get that with Bo Nix. So I think this is more of a super flex only, but, uh, or best ball as, as kind of like a spike week guy, maybe late in the season once the offense gets figured out. Um, and there's also, there's a bunch of options to stack with late in the draft. He's going as quarterback 30, 206 overall at the very least. Bo Nix is going to be the starter yes. for the Denver Broncos. You know, I don't want to hear about the Jarrett Stidham's, the Enough. Zach Wilson's of the world. Enough. Bo Nix is going to be a star. And you and I were very adamant from like the first watch of Bo Nix this offseason that he is not the player that people remembered at Auburn. It was different during his, his Oregon days. Now, want to bring up, and maybe this is a weird comparison, as we said about Deshaun Watson, that we, you know, haven't seen anything good with him in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we've seen anything good from Sean Payton since he's left uh, Drew Brees, yeah. but maybe this is the, I mean, it's kind of getting to that point of despite the investment, like, Hey, you got to show us something like yes. something here. I understand Russell Wilson can really hamstring you and he doesn't execute the offense in the way of definitely what a Sean Payton one wants to do. And so that does give me hope. That gives me hope because I believe Bo Nix can do that. He can take the simple stuff, but mm -hmm. he's also, I felt maybe even more comfortable throwing on the move than he was as just like a pure passing game player. There's athleticism to his game too. And he's, you know, when asked upon, can throw it down the field. Yeah. I I do really like Bo Nix as maybe the most underrated quarterback right now on underdog. Yeah, it's it, it's not it's not gonna be not gonna matter for for your redraft leagues or no. anything like that. But in in the leagues that we're doing, I think that he has a a little bit of an overlooked skill set. Like in terms of just like raw epa per play in those type of metrics we're talking about like the 99th percentile among drafted quarterbacks i don't care that he's old plays in this kind of gimmicky offense it's still very difficult to be able to post the type of production that he had and the ways that he he did do it um somewhat fantasy relevant in terms of the rushing stuff okay i'm going to close with will levis who is being drafted right now as quarterback 24 177 overall at its core brian callahan knows that Teams in the NFL must throw to lead, okay? I think the Titans are going to be top 10 in pass attempts across the league. Uh, now, to some of the negatives, 
Will Levis was 39th in completion percentage under pressure wow. this past season. But they've done something to change that. They drafted J.C. Latham. They're going to play at left tackle. Pair that with Peter Skronsky. They brought in Lloyd Cushenberry at center. The offensive line should help. Um, I've also coined Will Levis as the new trebuchet. I don't know if you've seen this tweet from Carter Donick, but he basically put together a Z score of quarterbacks on moving passes, meaning non-planted or shuffling throws. Uh, Will Levis only had 28 of these attempts, but his Z score was by far and away the worst at minus 1.5. The next closest was at 0.99. Mm. So what we need from Will Levis is a clean pocket, a nice offensive system so he can plant his feet and rip laser beams. Yes. And we're in a much better environment to do that this year, yeah. throwing to DeAndre Hopkins, Calvin Ridley, Tyler Boyd, Chico Quanquo, these running backs that I believe are going to be assets in the passing game and mm -hmm. Tajay Spears and Tony Pollard. So I'm excited for that because if that does happen, as we even saw in a worse environment and a worse situation during his rookie year, at the very least, I can give you two or three spike weeks. And heck, in a, I think, maybe undervalued because we just haven't seen an NFL field so far, uh, system and environment, that might give us five, six, seven of those. Yeah, this feels like a garbage time team, where but like projectable garbage time. I have my concerns with Will Levis. I thought even like in his best games, he was kind of like guessing on his reads. And some of those DeAndre Hopkins downfield bombs were uh, if you got if you asked him to design, what, what were you thinking on the whiteboard? He might not be able to tell you exactly what he was seeing there. But when you are as big and as athletic and could whip the ball like him uh, and I think everything, like you said, the offseason moves, everything's about we got to win through the air there. The Titans defense is, is probably more mediocre than it was with the Ryan Tannehill days. The the AFC South offenses can absolutely put up points nowadays. So there's going to be plenty of opportunity for in the fourth quarters where Will Levis is throwing absolute missiles. He's not really of a, the trebuchet type of arm, though. Like he throws it from here to here and he doesn't need this like big wind up. So that's like the totally. one nitpick. I he, have. he shouldn't move. A trebuchet needs yes. to stay in one place. But instead of the big arm, he can just sit there like this. And I mean, if he can throw the ball probably faster in terms of miles per hour than anyone yeah. in the league. Some of those throws are truly outrageous. You mentioned maybe questionable decisions. Uh, hot take somewhat OK with my quarterback having chicken with his head cut off moments. Uh, I mean, he had 22.4% of his passes were 20 plus yards on the field. That's a whopping 8% more than any other quarterback across the league. And I also believe we'll see, and we did last year, some chicken with his head cut off moments of him running the football. That might mean inside the 10 yard line mm -hmm. in the red zone, going for first downs. Uh, Cause he's a battering ram yes. when he wants to run the football yeah. too. So yeah, it's going to be a roller coaster. Do not get me wrong. Do not take him in single quarterback leagues. But this is a situation where I could see some really fun watches on a Monday following a Sunday where he throws for three touchdowns or four touchdowns and 300 yards. And then the next week puts up an absolute dud of a, like 172 yards. This I think that Will Levis's career is going to kind of be like what the Josh Allen rookie season was like over and over and over again, where we can have some fun. Um, and at the Josh Allen, that skill group had no talent. At least we have DeAndre Hopkins and Calvin Ridley here. But but at the same time, yeah, at the same time, like the thing we do know about Brian Callahan, it goes from Joe Burrow's rookie year, which was deep shot, deep shot, deep shot, to Joe Burrow. Hey, we're going to run cover two, so you can't do that. So it's mm -hmm. we're not going to run play action. Everything's out of shotgun, eyes downfield all times, quick hitting passes. Then to Joe Burrow's hurt, we have to bring in Jake Browning, which is a totally different style of offense. And then Jake Browning becomes a super efficient passer, mm -hmm. albeit to shorter areas of the field. So we know he can like alter and change his offense, the traits and the skills, and listen to his quarterback. And so maybe they just like have the right mojo and the right playbook for yeah. Will Levis to have some consistency to his game too. Yeah, it, it's a lot of pressure because he wasn't the one exactly calling the plays, but he obviously had a huge yeah. input there. And you're, you're, when your dad's the best offensive line coach basically ever, uh, that's 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 a good addition. I think that J.C. Latham was one of my favorite prospects to watch in general. So um, I think it'll be exciting, kind of like they're on Thursday Night Football. Like, all right, let's fire this thing up and see what happens. Any honorable mentions you want to throw out before we get out of here? 
Daniel Jones is is definitely my yep. favorite honorable mention here. The last two seasons, now one of them, he only played a couple of games. He's finished 124th and 94th uh, overall in fantasy points over replacement per game. Those were with absolutely scrubs at wide receiver. One of my favorite ways to play Malik Neighbors is to tack on Daniel Jones in like the last round of drafts. Obviously, we get a ton of rushing production, assuming his ACL is intact. But Malik Neighbors, I think he can bring this Giants team from being like 31st to maybe being like 24th. Like he might be that good of a player. Um, And I think that would really help Daniel Jones. There's some benching risk late in the season. And that's probably like the main reason why he goes so late um, because there's like contract reasons. There's injury guarantees. But if he's playing well, this coaching staff is going to want to keep him in there because their jobs are on the line here. And if Daniel Jones is not playing well, then that means the draft pick was bad already. So I'm not even worried about the benching risk. Like he's either playing well and he's in my lineups. Good pick. He's not going to get benched or he was playing bad. He was going to be a bad pick. He's going to get benched. It doesn't really matter there. So I think that Malik neighbor is going to like completely change the offense. And I think that Brian Dable is a decent uh, play caller. So I think that's yeah. the best way to play it. And I know he's coming off a significant injury, but he's probably the one from quarterback 15 and on that has the most rushing upside other than Deshaun Watson of this grouping of quarterbacks uh i don't know if you saw the first episode of hard knocks i'm only seeing clips of it Mm -hmm. uh from the off season and joe shane basically said or someone on the staff did that hey we don't pay daniel jones 40 million dollars to hand it off to a 12 million dollar running back in saquon barkley so like hey daniel jones joe shane and brian dayball i believe unless i'm reading the situation incorrectly are all tied together like something has to give and they got over their skis a little bit somehow manufacturing a playoff team out of that first mm-hmm. season they had together last year everything fell apart maybe it's somewhere in the middle but man that first thing they had together they really utilized his athleticism and yes. his rushing ability yep and I, I don't think that they have a true number two wide receiver but wandale jalen hyatt darius slayton like that seems like three number three wide receivers and they kind of use the best of them as well so it's just a better environment and they've invest in the offensive line a little bit. We can't end the show without bringing up Drake May. There's a chance that he doesn't play for half the season there, but Drake May, his scramble rates going back to college were awesome. We know that he can throw the ball down the field. I I do think that Jacoby Brissett is going to play a decent amount this year, um, and I understand why that would be the case, but late in the season, Drake May is just like too athletic, too big, uh, had too many big moments at North Carolina to not kind of qualify as a sleeper. I am shocked you didn't want to talk about J.J. McCarthy after all the love that you gave him during the draft process after Kirk Cousins finished as the quarterback seven in points per game last year at 19.3. Just interpreting your thoughts by spending the draft process with you, it kind of felt like, uh, hey, if he's plugged into an awesome situation, which this is, and he's asked to throw the football more frequently, Mm -hmm. which he would be, then he's just going to star. I think that J.J. McCarthy would be kind of fun if he gets the starting job he's just a little bit down in the draft compared to some of the other guys and sam darnold i i think that there's this fetish in the nfl about sam darnold and they want to see what happens with him so and i think that there's a chance that sam darnold is like not that bad and like with this type of environment that he kind of holds on to that job for a little bit longer so i like jj mccarthy's like long term he he's still definitely a developmental guy who's so young so inexperienced generally that i kind of liked him more like as a dynasty pick um and i think that sam darnold might play like half the year and then if that's the case it's hard for me to get on board well we'll be on the lookout during preseason during training camp during all the games so be sure to hit that subscribe button Uh, i cannot wait for august september when we get some actual on-field stuff to react to uh, so lock it in here ahead of all of your fantasy football drafts. Shout out to producer Weaves. Shout out to Hayden. Shout out to all of you. If we forgot one of your favorite quarterback sleepers, again, make sure that an underdog, they are round 10 plus, ADP of 120 plus, so they qualify. We've given some you know names and mentions down there. We're like, why do you talk about this guy? Well, he's going three rounds earlier than that. Okay? <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. Those are not the rules. So <laughs> we're playing on the hard mode. There, there's going to be some guys that are sleepers <laughs> in the Yahoo drafts that we're going to make videos for later on that right. are being drafted in the 70s on underdog. Right. Jane Daniels cannot be your sleeper, guys. He's yes. going and this is a top 100 selection. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. That does it. We'll check you on the next one. See you. <laughs>